Our next speaker is Dr. Wendy Ann McCarty. She's a registered nurse, psychology consultant, educator, researcher, and author. She founded the prenatal and perinatal psychology program at Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. Her new ebook, Welcoming Consciousness, Supporting Wholeness from the Beginning of Life, which integrates the theory and practice of prenatal and perinatal psychology with other development, developmental, developmental theories. I'm sorry. She serves as mentor for many professionals and organizations, as well as a consultant and speaker around the world. Her talk will be on consciousness at the beginning of life. Please welcome Dr. Wendy. Hi, everybody. So good to be here. Let me get set up here. Start the timer so I keep myself on time for you all. <clears throat> Hello, is the microphone on? Microphone is on. Can you hear me all right if I'm back here? All right. Well, Sonia called me or emailed me and invited me. And I'm so glad you did. Thank you so much. Um, and to the organization for inviting me and for valuing the message that I bring. This subject has inspired me, touches me deeply. And I'm really grateful to have the time to uh, be with it with each and every one of you. So one business item, I'm going to ask that no individual photographs or recordings be taken of the slides or images. I don't have permission for some of them. And so if you're watching the DVD or stream, I ask not to make any reproductions either. Thanks. So I feel this talk is a celebration of who we are, who babies are and who we now have the opportunity to become as we recognize, acknowledge, and nurture baby's greater multidimensional whole self. When I meditated about this talk and the message of it, I was really feeling the beauty of it, the beauty of the message. I had drank the Kool-Aid, <laughs> and I was feeling the resonance of it, and the words of this subtitle came to me. Aligning our multidimensional wholeness and awakening our human experience and healing within its embrace. So I thought, how do I convey that? I mean, we're going to talk about it, but how do I convey the felt sense of that? And then I saw this picture, and I thought, yeah, that's it. Oh, you know what? I'm so used to doing it on my computer. There we go. There's that face. That face, yeah, aligning our multidimensional wholeness and awakening our human experience and healing within its embrace. Yeah. So in the last five minutes of our time today, I have a very special separate little side show, um, slideshow to the song Happy that's very popular. Uh, that has many images of babies and families in it. And I can't wait to show it to you. I was so tickled making it. It just lifts us into the resonance I'm talking about. So we have lot to look forward to, many of you guys, at the end. And, um, but now let's go to the didactic material. So I want to start with some core concepts. You know, we come from many different professions and traditions. And yet, there's some unifying principles that are universal to guide us. And I have to keep remembering to use this one. Whenever we're talking about healing, well-being, human potential, we're always talking about the fundamentals of moving towards greater wholeness, 
coherence and right relationship. I'm a board certified holistic nurse and I like the descriptions of these concepts in our uh, nursing, holistic nursing, a handbook for practice. Wholeness is about the relationship of the parts of a system to one another and to the larger systems of which they are a part. Increasing wholeness of a system is about establishing a pattern of right relationship among its elements that is more and more coherent. A synergistic whole is created that is more than the sum of the parts and that synergistic whole organizes the parts. Well, in the new paradigm, the universe is seen as one interconnected whole, so how do we increase wholeness if we're already one whole? And I really like this quote. When physicist David Bohm was asked, how does anything become more whole if everything is already a part of the indivisible wholeness of the implicit order of the universe? He responded with one word, coherence. Increasing the wholeness of a system is about establishing a pattern of relationships among its elements that are more and more coherent. Healing, a process of being and becoming whole, an emerging pattern of relationships among elements of the whole person that leads to greater integrity, connection, and cohesion of the whole system. This pattern of relationship can be called right relationship. Thus, healing is the emergence of right relationship at or between and among any and all of the levels of human experience. And it's a process rather than a state. Okay, so when we support these, we're supporting wholeness, coherence, and right relationship. But then the question comes up when we're talking about self as a human being, what whole self are we talking about? Babies, what whole self are we talking about? Our notions about wholeness and who we are are held within our worldviews, our paradigms, our core beliefs, and these shape our fundamental principles and goals that guide our education, training, work, and family life, as we've been talking about this morning. Our notions about babies are undergoing a fundamental evolution and change. At the core nature of what we consider a baby's whole self at the beginning of life to be. And this evolution of thought has repercussions over our entire lifespan for health and healing and wholeness. So in this talk, I'm gonna take you on the journey of evolution through my eyes and my experience I'm going to briefly orient you to the field of prenatal and perinatal psychology and what we've been learning from babies. There's so much to share, rich amount of uh, findings and experiences, et cetera. I've selected a few highlights from theory, core principles, and a few clinical stories to bring these concepts alive. So I hope this talk can be a touch point for this new landscape of early development. So let's start where I started. I was feeling very nostalgic. Oh, here I am. 1973, I can't believe it's 40 years ago. I graduated with a BA in nursing at the University of Kentucky. Those are my parents. Hi, on the other side, but here today. <laughs> Hello, my mom's just like, she's very happy. <laughs> um, as she would say, I'm so proud of you, honey. <laughs> um, so I started out as an obstetrical nurse at the University of Kentucky. I got a master's degree in family studies and infant development. I loved all the theories of development, the research on babies. I just soaked it up and I did my transition to parenthood as my thesis topic. So I realized I really wanted to work um, more on a psychological level with families. So what did I do? I went on and got my PhD in counseling psych at the University of Southern California and did my dissertation on transition to parenthood. 
and I became a marriage and family therapist and um, had a private practice. And I had been working for 16 years, and I felt like I really understood whole baby, wholeness at the beginning of life. Now looking back, I realize I understood it, but it was within the framework of the Newtonian assumptions and how all of our training, education, and research was within that paradigm. I didn't know at the time, but something was about to happen to change my life. I got this brochure for a conference. <laughs> The Power of Prenatal and Perinatal Experience, Maximizing Human Potential Throughout Life. It looks innocent, doesn't it? <laughs> looks inviting, looks innocent. Well, I thought, wow, I wonder what that means. Now, you can't really see it from back there, but this was the actual brochure. And some of the presentations were the truth about newborns, discovering their capabilities birth trauma and its significance to psychotherapy, cellular consciousness, the mind-body network, pre- and perinatal patterns in adults, and birth-oriented psychotherapy with infants. And I went, wait a minute, I've been in psychology and I've been in birth. What would psychotherapy with an infant even look like? I was really intrigued and a little disoriented, and I decided to go. And there I learned uh, some of the, and I'm going to just go through a few of the little core things from, from prenatal and perinatal psychology as I started to get oriented with it. First, there were these two books. They were classic books in the field in 1980s. In 1981, Dr. Thomas Verney was a uh, Canadian psychiatrist, and he was about to embark on a coast-to-coast -coast book promotion for his new groundbreaking book, The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, when he read a report in the Toronto paper about a psychologist in San Diego, California, Dr. David Chamberlain. Well, David was a hypno-psychotherapist whose research had demonstrated that children's memories at their births were real. And Thomas was very interested in meeting with him, and he wrote to them, and they began a 33-year friendship and collaboration. In 1982, David and Thomas sent in a proposal to present a joint workshop on their pre- and perinatal findings in adults at the 1982 APA annual meeting. Their presentation was quickly rejected. They made a great decision. They decided to form their own community to share and grow this material. So they organized their first conference in 1983, which is the one, uh, not the one I went to, but started in 1983. They founded the association at that time and began their peer review journal. So. When I went, what I got was, okay, I was getting the general message that how babies are conceived, carried, and birthed mattered greatly over the entire lifespan. And that babies are conscious, aware, learning, and communicating meaningfully at the beginning of life. You know, that sounded really inspiring, but I really didn't have any idea what they were meaning because it just didn't fit my Newtonian model whatsoever. And they were saying that experiences during the prenatal through birth and bonding set in motion our foundational life patterns. That it set in motion core beliefs, subconscious programming, autonomic function, and that these are seen in every aspect of our being. You pick one. How we deal with change, our self-image, how we come in and out of relationship, uh, our ability to pace time and move through time and space, our states of consciousness, every part of our being, 
they were saying, we are seeing the beginning of these core foundational life patterns beginning prenatal and at birth. And they were reporting that unfortunately, most of our findings found cascading life diminishing effects of our modern ear misunderstanding of who babies are and their capacities, missed opportunities of greater connection and relationship with them. And how many, unfortunately, of our medical and professional care practices leave babies with trauma, unmet needs, and life diminishing imprints. This was very disturbing. I really didn't understand it at the time, but I was one of those practitioners. And I thought, what are we doing that, that, that's leaving babies with this? And I wanted to find out more. But what I really got was so unique Sorry, I'm getting a little goofy with the uh, my slides and, and uh, there we are, their slides. Um, they were talking about babies so differently and I was a little disoriented with that and what I really started soaking in was their perspective was from the baby's perspective, baby's experience. The field had grown out of therapists in training wanting to share more and explore what they were finding with their clients and families. In their search for the origin of current issues, therapists often were unexpectedly, back then, taken back to a traumatic or diff difficult experience in the womb during birth or as a newborn. And the field really grew with pre and perinatal oriented therapeutic clinical work with adults children and babies and treatment of how to treat current issues with connecting what happened back then and working with it to what was happening now to resolve both well the person that I my life changed in that this one talk um, is dr. William Emerson's he was the psychotherapy with infants. And during that video, he was talking about the way he did birth-oriented psychotherapy with babies. And he showed a video of a three-month-old that he was holding. And he was having an intimate dialogue. I wish I could tell you the whole thing because it was just so special. But they were talking about now and they were talking about the birth. And the baby had a difficult birth. And he was saying, yeah, I know, we're talking about when you were born, yeah, yeah. And a little red blotch came across, a somatic memory of a cord around the baby's neck. And he says, yeah, in that, that place, it was really tight. Yeah, and you didn't have enough air. And the baby reacts. And he says, yeah, that was a scary place. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. That was really scary, huh? And the baby looks at him with these eyes of what looked like appreciation. Like you get it. Like we feel when someone gets us when we've gone through something so hard. In that moment, and I got goosebumps. 24 years later, I get goosebumps about it. Because in that moment, as I watched, my normal way of perceiving babies were suspended. I found myself sensing the meaningfulness of the baby's verbal and nonverbal communication as meaningful in a dialogue with Dr. Emerson. And I experienced the baby's depth of presence that appeared to be that baby's appreciation of being with him in that difficult place and talking to him in this way. And the moment changed me. And it shattered what I thought whole baby meant. I felt that I had perceived some grander self being expressed by this baby. And my next thing to myself was, because I felt very disoriented and shook up by it, why had I never seen that before? Why had I never seen that before in all the years, all my expertise, all my training, all the times with babies, and I saw something different that day. So William, the second part of his talk, 
he talked about some follow-up. He had pioneered how to do this kind of work with infants. It was new territory. There weren't any studies. There weren't anybody else doing it. it he was the first one. And he really wanted to see, he worked with babies and their parents, what happened. So he started following them up. And um, as they got older, and he saw some of the children, he interviewed the parents, teachers, other people who knew them. And he was just trying to get the themes. You know, what did he learn about this group of human beings as they grew up? And he was even surprised because what he found was these positive psychology characteristics of the, how the children were described as being very loving, very trusting, emotionally aware and expressive, empathetic, mutual, positive bonding and attachment, non-aggressive, perceptive, and proficient in human potential and their individualized talents and abilities even being expressed as infants to children. They would seek out experiences that were unique, might not even be the interest of their parents, and hold focus and explore in depth. So I believe when the babies were relating to William and their parents during those sessions, and the parents and William were communicating with that baby, as a whole, conscious, aware, capable being, that it started a process that the parents then took on, a whole different way of communicating, holding, being with their babies, that led to greater wholeness, coherence, and right relationship within their child growing up, and these positive psychology outcomes were manifested. So I decided, OK, I'm in. I want to learn more about this. I started training. And um, I opened up my psychotherapy practice for the first time with young children. And I named my business Wondrous Beginnings. I was so inspired about this new human potential, about who we can become. And I was also, at the same time, diving into my own spiritual path and my own spirituality and working between the realms very actively, post-death, pre-death, in between, um, and was getting more and more comfortable in this greater reality. And um, it was very wondrous to me. So I named my business Wondrous Beginnings. With the children, as I started seeing them, and it was orienting towards what had happened during prenatal and birth period, I videotaped all my sessions for about, well, for years. And for about the first year and a half, I transcribed every session. And it wasn't just what people said. I would say, OK, the parents talked about when labor began, and the baby crawled into the tunnel at the same time. Babies talk about we were separated at birth, Baby comes out of the tunnel and heads the other way. So I was trying to get, how are babies showing us what uh, their way of being with the material? And then how do we interact and acknowledge that? And it was, it was wonderful. So um, in my book, there's more examples of this, but I want to just show you one because you get it. Uh, this was one of my first um, there we go. This was one of my first families, and it was a 13-month-old adopted boy and his adoptive parents. And he wasn't attaching. He was very unattached. He was a sweet little boy, but not attaching at all. OK, so they come in my room, and on one wall, I have all these symbols and toys, anything that could look like a sperm, an egg, uh, conception, being in the womb, coming out of the womb, mommy, baby hospital scenes, all kinds of things, about 400 symbols over here. And um, the parents walk in, go right over to the couch. He toddles in, so cute, goes right to the symbols, of course. And he goes right over. And he picks his foot up, and he drops it in the 13-month-old baby. 
Okay, so this is one of my first cases, and I'm going, oh my God, I'm supposed to know what this means. I have no idea what this means. <laughs> is this Maryland? Is this, no, he wouldn't know who Maryland is, but we do, but you know, what is this? Um, and of course, I had no clue whatsoever. So as we're talking in that first session, I asked the parents, do you have a scrapbook? They said, yeah. They had done an open adoption. They took pictures. Had he seen them? No. And they said, we're waiting till he's older. He wouldn't understand them now. And I said, well, would you mind? I think it could be really helpful to bring them in now and let's look at them together with him. So two weeks later, they brought it in. And I opened a page. You'll see this person is, their head's not there for confidentiality. And there's a picture in the book. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? That was Marilyn. And then she's in the book. Who do you think that might be? It was his birth mother. This is an example, I've seen this thousands of times. This is an example of how specific memory is. This was his mother, the last day he saw her, the last thing she had on, when she kissed him goodbye, got on the plane, signed the papers, and he was two weeks old. And that's his memory of that. And not only that, some part of him knew as we begin therapy to help him, some part of him knew to go over and get that doll and put it in the middle of the room. Was it just that he's attracted to that unfinished story, needed help? I don't know. But it rippled through me because it, I was starting to collect my own direct experience with children that Dr. William Emerson and others had talked about. And this is Again, how specific memory is. Those two dolls were next to each other. He didn't pick the yellow one, he picked the black one. Over and over again, I've been awed by the integrity of babies and children who tell their stories. I've had little kids tell stories, very complex scenarios that last over days of what happened and I'm thinking of one, and it was when he was five months in utero. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, in 1993, Ray Castellino and I founded BEBA, and it was a nonprofit clinic where we wanted to study and provide this type of pre and perinatal birth oriented therapy for babies, um, newborn on up with families. And we wanted to train professionals in the specialty. It was an amazing time and we discovered a lot. And one of the things that we were discovering that I just, I was absolutely uh, intrigued by is how we were learning more and more and more how babies are showing us their very established core beliefs from the very beginning of life. We just hadn't recognized it. Um, I wrote a paper on it uh, in my book that's out here, uh, Welcoming Consciousness. It's as that journal article that has four clinical vignettes from, this, from the clinic are in it um, that, that talk about the power of belief, what babies are teaching us. I'm going to skip ahead. 2000, or, uh, 1999, Dr. Marty Glenn approached me and she said, you know, I don't think we're going to get a prenatal and perinatal psychology degree program in any established university yet. It's just too early. I want to start our own private institute. Will you help me co-author and co-create the graduate degrees in our specialty? And I said yes, and wow, what a roller coaster we, we began. Uh, within a year, we had opened with six degree programs, masters and PhDs in prenatal and perinatal psychology, and we also had somatic psychology. Well, it, um, 
it was a very challenging time for me coming up with the curriculum. Here we were trying to teach professionals who were going to be out in the field. And um, although I had had a lot of training and expertise in infant development within a Newtonian model, when I started working within a pre and perinatal, let's say, model, I had to consciously keep letting that go because those beliefs just kept bleeding into my missing things with kids. The more and more I, my repertoire grew to what it can include, I realized how those things were not helpful, many of them. Well, when we were doing our degree programs, I had to come back out and interface what's in mainstream about early development and what we are finding in early development. And it's as if we were talking about different, different people. Because still, twentieth century early development models are based on biological view of human development. Understanding is from observation from outside in of babies, and it's held within a Newtonian worldview assumption. Brain development was assumed to be the function and capability, uh, was to be the foundation of capacity to perceive, respond, be conscious, communicate meaningfully, and to learn. And consciousness was assumed to develop from and within the biological development. And babies' awareness was considered undifferentiated from mothers and environment, and it was thought that the baby's sense of self took 18 months to stabilize and create. And when I reviewed the indexes of all the major textbooks, there was still no mention of consciousness, primary consciousness, anything like that. Then I took what we were learning from pre and perinatal psychology, and our perspective at the heart of it is from the baby's point of view, from a subjective life experience point of view. And our findings went beyond Newtonian assumptions. We were finding babies sentient, aware, and conscious at multiple levels of being prior to conception, during prenatal life, birth, and the newborn period. We were finding baby sentience, self, sense of self, and many capacities were not dependent on the biological brain development. They proceeded. And we were finding that babies' own personal perspective and experience, as well as their experience of their mother environment, were present from the very beginning of life. So <clears throat> I saw another issue in teaching this to professionals. We had a wealth of findings, wealth of clinical experience within the field of pre and perinatal psychology, but we really didn't have lens, a, a theory, a model where someone went out and looked at all of it and tried to make sense of it and come up with a, a way of, a different way rather than the Newtonian model of looking at early development. So since I was teaching those courses, I thought I'd better get going and do it myself. <laughs> so I got an academic grant and uh, for a year and a half looked at all the different sciences and paradigms and um, uh, from early development, but ventured out to many more. And of course, that's, we're in the midst of this fundamental paradigm shift from Newtonian biology-based into consciousness-based interconnected universe paradigm. So I read a lot. Some of the ones that I really, uh, really stayed with me a lot was Edgar Mitchell's quantum holographic theory. In fact, I dialogued with him about that. And uh, Gary, are you here? Gary Schwartz? Yeah. Oh, he did. Oh, shoot. So two of his books, and I was very interested in his universal living memory theory um, and his afterlife experiments. And, you know, I'm talking to the choir here, but just to say it was a relief to see that there was more science and more support. There was a basket that could hold our pre and perinatal findings now, because theory and practice and healing and these were expanding to these multi dimensional, I'm so sorry, get out of sync here, understandings. 
that took the nature of reality, human nature, communication, health, and healing, now beyond physical, emotional, mental, including energetic and non-local. I love this quote. Consciousness shifts our healing efforts and results from a change that expands the scope of what is possible to a change that actually transforms the entire landscape. And that's so true for early development. When we bring in consciousness and what we know about baby's consciousness, the whole landscape of early development transforms. So I came up with my integrated model of early development and my book, uh, it's, it started out as an e-book, but it's a published uh, paper book, is out there. I published the building of it step by step with the clinical findings and clinical examples. And uh, the model is expressed in welcoming consciousness, supporting, supporting baby's wholeness from the beginning of life, an integrated model of early development. And it's now in uh, German, Portuguese, Portuguese? <laughs> I could, yay, Portuguese, yeah. Unfortunately, the books did not come, uh, but you can get them, order online. And um, in the bibliography that I gave you is the title in Portuguese. And um, also, if you want to get the book, Welcoming Consciousness, I hope you get it while you're at the conference. I want to give the proceeds to the organization. And um, so I'd love for you to pay retail price to the association. <laughs> OK, so what I'm going to do is go through just a few core principles from the model just to orient you with it. Um, it's wonderful to have lots of examples to, to explain what they mean, but those are in the book. So one of the most important findings from pre- and perinatal psychology that we see throughout the literature is that when we look at babies this way, we find that babies have a dual perspective. And they're each very unique perspectives. And they have both perspectives from the beginning of life, transcendental and human. The transcendental is what has totally just over during our modern ear because it's transcendental. <laughs> okay, so let's go into the transcendental. What we find is that many of the characteristics of babies' transcendental self-perspective are similar to the qualities expressed in near-death experience. From preconception forward, we find babies have non-local avenues of being, non-local avenues of perception and awareness, knowing, communication. The vantage point is from outside the body. Babies have non-local, lucid, omni-perception that perceives the whole of experiences from their point of view. Babies demonstrate a mature comprehension of wisdom of comprehension and wisdom of events, people's thoughts, feelings, intentions, and accurate descriptions of situations and dynamics. They have non-local primary knowing about things that arise from the non-local field, including knowings about past, present, and future. It's a direct, intuitive, gestalt knowing of things. They also demonstrate access and experience to both realms, both spiritual and physical. And with conception, the transcendental self-perspective views the baby's body as this lovely house, this lovely vehicle that they'll inhabit for their life that they're embarking on. From this perspective, they have an I am presence. I am. I am. Timeless, continuous. Human. From pre- and perinatal standpoint, the human perspective, in contrast, is from within the body. Awareness, ways of knowing and communicating are 
biologically based within the context of the physical plane of reality, within time, space of location, and the domain of human emotions and mental fields of experience. The baby's human awareness, communication, and knowing are through a symphony of energetic, biochemical, cellular, somatic experiences, all embedded in the human emotional and mental layers of experience. These perceptions and capabilities do grow with a growing baby's body and brain. At the core, the baby's biologically based experiences are relational with its environment. The developing human self is intricately related and yes, in part, merged with their mother's experience, the health of a womb, and their physical and emotional journey together at birth. But babies also demonstrate their own unique experience and responses. The developing human is instinctive, sensitive, responsive, adaptive, emotional, and intentional. And lastly, the baby's human self has an innate intelligence of right relationship. What holds coherence, harmony, and goodness, and what doesn't? And the baby responds and adapts, choosing protection, growth, or protection points of view, beliefs, or uh, growth. So although I've talked about these perspectives very briefly, uh, separately, the beauty in our fur further, excuse me, fuller understanding of babies and their pre and perinatal experience is held in what I believe to be the inseparable relationship between their transcendental perspective and the human perspective in a synergistic relational whole of self that is both non-local and local. Holographic principles suggest that our three-dimensional reality is a product of the interaction of non-local and local experience. Both perspectives are necessary to create our reality. The dynamic interaction of the two perspectives create a synergistic whole that's more than the sum of the parts. That whole created by those two perspectives is actually more than the sum of the parts, and that greater Synergistic whole functions to organize the parts. That's what's so, the greater synergistic whole between these two parts functions to organize the parts. That's how I see our transcendental and human perspectives functioning. That synergistic whole I call the integrated self. And uh, when I'm talking about it academically, I describe the integrative self as a holonomic, holographic, self-organizing, dynamic self-system, otherwise known as your baby. <laughs> this ever-evolving relationship is an intricate and intimate dance with each perspective informing and changing the experience of the other. So let's return to our fundamentals. Greater healing, well-being, and human potential lies in creating and sustaining greater coherence and right relationship alignment to increase greater wholeness in our being. I've come to believe that our greater human potential lies in our ability to align our human self-experience with our primary non-local transcendental consciousness to create the most coherent and clear channel. I'm talking to the tribe here. <laughs> so what's their message? What do they want us to get? What do they want us to hear? And it's, you know, at the, at the core, it's very simple. I am a person. I know I am. I know I am. And I can relate meaningfully. And I know you are you. And this is prior to conception forward. And what I see preconception forward is this innate urge and need to communicate, to connect, to form relationship, to be seen, 
to know love. So I hear from them, communicate, consider me, connect. I'm here. So I could spend a lot of time. We could spend, you know, I've been, our field has been studying for decades. What makes up this baby's multidimensional world? I mean, it's a whole new world that hasn't, isn't out in mainstream. And we could, I'd love us to just sit around the campfires, they say, for days. <laughs> but in a moment, I want to just say about this, what I call the holographic family field. There's all kinds of fields and different specialties, cranial sacral versus, you know, different uh, spiritual traditions. We talk about different fields of energy. Well, I, I put it together because whether we're intervening at a physical level, a mental, um, uh, emotional, a spiritual level, I believe we're holographic beings. So I believe that we are changing the whole hologram wherever we are making a change. We are sharing information at that level. So babies, what I have found from babies is that they live in this holographic world of their family, those personal to them. So in my practice over the years and from what babies and children have shown us, we see that babies are exquisitely sensitive and responsible to these relational holographic fields of information from the very beginning of life. Babies learn, develop, adapt, imprint, and communicate within the interconnected holographic field of their family and the personal experience around them. And this family field of information sharing goes way beyond what we thought they were capable of within our Newtonian because it, uh, viewpoint. Because it's physical, it's emotional, mental, energetic, non-local, it's sophisticated, it's when you think of near death and that type of awareness, that's what we see coming in with babies. So babies are immersed in this. And this field contains ancestral, past, current, future, especially what's unresolved, uh, unfinished, or early trauma is stored in that. And babies are immersed in this complex field of information. And they build their core being in relationship to this world. And think of this, they have an innate intelligence that says of right relationship. Think of how many things we hold at a conscious level and hold in conflict at a subconscious level. Babies are getting all of that. That's what we see. And that's what they're learning how to be a human being. That's what they're imprinting to become the human being they are. We have generational messages, our messages from our past. I've seen little toddlers play out sophisticated things that happened 20 years ago in their parents' life that the parents have never talked about. They're, and it's like this one child was doing it, walking around, playing this out for three weeks, just stuck on it. We had no idea what they were showing us. We just kept trying to listen, and the mom said, I don't know. And finally, the mom said, you know, I don't think this has anything to do with it, but it just came to mind. It was something that had happened 20 years ago. And as soon as she brought it up, the baby went over to the basket, first time in three weeks, picked up a different toy, which was about where she was going with the story. And the story moved. So somehow that baby was like, huh. Walking around for three weeks. What do I do with this? What do I do with this? And when we talked about it and explained, and we could kind of see the meaningfulness of why it was coming up now, the baby was like, oh, okay. Never brought it up again. That baby was under a year's, year old. So this is a wonderful way of looking at it, and I've written some more about it. So if you're interested for the thirsty learner, there's more out there. So I'm about to switch here into a story, one family story that I picked out to tell you. And this is a principle that I find with thousands of people that I've worked with and other people in our field find. Healing with compassionate truth. 
I believe when we reach an authentic truth, oh, I believe when we reach an authentic truth, when we address something genuinely that has remained unresolved, unspoken, or unreachable, and when we come to acknowledge and compassionately hold that experience of that truth, our transcendental self and human self come into a beautiful alignment and we become more whole. And I believe that's at the heart of healing. Some part of us remembers. <clears throat> okay, so this is a family story. This story is from my current private practice. And it illustrates some of these core concepts and gives you an example of how I put into practice uh, pre and perinatal psychology wisdom and energy psychology, which is my other specialty, my other field, energy psychology. Um, I work with families now by phone. I work very differently than I did in the past with uh, that type of on the floor play therapy and sessions. So I work with families by phone and Skype and I use energy psychology with families. I wanted healing techniques that were simple and safe and effective and shifting patterns that parents could use at home. And one of the ones that I use is EFT tapping. How many people know EFT tapping? Quite a few, yeah. Okay, so I use my version of EFT tapping and some other modalities. I use them in the session and I teach parents then how to use them with their kids and it becomes a way of life. So mothers are often the parent who contacts me for help with something that's going on, usually with their baby now, or their child now. And I start by taking a very in-depth pre and perinatal history, their pre and perinatal experience and the parent's pre and perinatal experience, all the way up to current behavior. So I'm always looking at current behavior, what happened then, and just holding them and seeing if there's any relationship. So just a couple words about EFT, emotional freedom technique, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's a way of you're tapping on certain meridian points while you're focusing on whatever it is that's the problem. Could be a trauma, a stress, a large emotional reaction, all kinds of different things. And you're tapping. And one other specific thing, as you bring it to mind, you're focusing on it, you make a statement. So even though I have this, even though I'm really stressed right now, I love and accept myself. Even though I didn't do a very good job at that other thing I was just working on, I forgive myself. It's always you're putting whatever is going on, the honest truth of it, and something really positive. And I see this as bringing our human and transcendental self together the human constriction and the expanded love, joy, forgiveness, acceptance from our transcendental self. That's how I interpret this. So, and by tapping with the positive and constrictive and tapping points while you focus on it, trauma resolves. I've just, it's, I can, someone can have horrible post-traumatic stress and within one session, we're, it's, it's, she's at peace. It's so effective. Uh, I just love it. So, okay, here's the story. It's about Ian. He was used to seeing EFT because I had helped the family with his older sister when she had a severe school phobia. And with his sister, we found she had a connection with what happened early on and why she could not leave her parents' side and why she had stopped going to school. And we worked with EFT and worked with these, and it resolved beautifully. So the whole family would do EFT for her. Ian was only three years old, so they would be walking to school doing EFT together. And of course, as a three-year-old, him at four years old already knew that EFT helped with hard feelings and you felt better afterwards. <laughs> so the mother asked me, can we focus on Ian? He, he really has a long-standing challenge I'd love your help with. 
He's a very loving, caring, sensitive boy, but when he goes into a social setting and starts coming into a relationship with other people, other kids, like at soccer, he seems to lose conscious awareness. He gets this fight, this life-death comp competitiveness, especially with his sister, and he doesn't really get where his body is in space. It's like he's thrashing all around, and the kids around him get hurt. And he's desperate to be chosen, to be in the middle of the things, and he's just devastated when things don't work out with other children. He's just devastated. And he feels like everything's fallen apart, it'll never be put back together, and it has a great deal of intensity. She said because the other kids get hurt around him, they sometimes don't like to play with him. So they would avoid him, and it would perpetuate his fear. He wouldn't get chosen, and he'd be devastated. And his parents had worked with him with his behavior, trying to get him to be more aware, conscious of his actions, but nothing was working. So the mother said most social situations for years had been white-knuckling it for her, of trying to watch and manage and make sure he, he the other kids didn't get hurt and uh, try and manage the situation. Okay, so where do we start? Well, first, I said to the mom, how about if we do EFT for your charged reactions about it all? Even though I have this dread it's going to happen again. Even though I just, oh, there he goes again feeling. I love and accept myself and I love and accept him. So we started with hers because that changed the holographic field he was in, if hers were less. Then I suggested taking the focus off the specific problematic behavior and talk more to him, focus more on what he was feeling, his emotions, thoughts, somatic sensations, and to be empathetic with him about it. Our goal was to have slow things down get more awareness of what the feelings and thoughts were that were coming up and to empathize with discovering more of what came out. I took uh, extensive pre and perinatal history and I saw some possibilities of what was in his early history and his current behavior, so mom and I talked about that. And I suggested that she ask him if he remembers when he first came in her tummy. I suggested try not to lead him just see where he goes with it. So the mom asked him, do you remember when you first came in my tummy? He said, yeah, it was really easy to connect with you. I could see your heart right away. But then I felt lonely. Sissy, Sissy was having all that milky, 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 and she was kicking all night long, and I couldn't sleep. And somebody was with me. But then I turned away, and when I turned back, they were gone, and I was so lonely. His mother shared with me she had had him through IVF. She had had two embryos transferred into her womb. She remembers being two months pregnant, coming down the stairs one morning. She said that she felt like she had been up all night for two weeks because of her two-year-old, who had gotten very needy and wanted to nurse during the night. And her two-year-old had this agitated, kicking, nursing, all night long kind of thing. And that morning, she had started to bleed heavily. So she went and got an ultrasound. There was only one baby remaining. The twin was no longer there. She shared with me, she said after listening to her son talk about that, she was rather stunned, taking it in, that her son so accurately told the story of what had happened back, back then. And she was getting the connection it had with his frantic, unconscious behavior to be in the center of things and the devastation with kids when they left. Her son's description, so notice, her son's description of what he first experienced in mommy's tummy was through both the inside and outside vantage points. He had distinct, strong emotional responses that were his own experience. 
And he knew the dynamics of what was happening. Sissy was milking all night long. He was six or seven weeks in utero at that time. So what did the mother do? The mother validated his early experience and talked to him more about it. She said, you know, you're right. That had been the plan to have two babies. And someone did come in with you. That's right. I guess it wasn't possible for that baby to stay. But you stayed, and we're so glad you stayed. And Sissy was milky, milky, milky all night long, wasn't she? And the mom thought about the twin loss and her heavy bleeding, and she said, I bet you had to work really hard to stay. That really frantic place, I bet you had to work really hard to stay. And he got really quiet, and he said, I did. So they did EFT for the baby's feelings, and for now, even though I had to work really hard to stay and I had to fight to stay, I really trust that it's okay to relax. It's safe now to relax. And his mom guided him, and they did it together. Even though it was really close and I had to really fight to stay, it's safe now to just relax. I made it. So when his behavior came up in the outer world, because this took a little bit of time in different situations uh, working with it, his parents would say, oh, you know, I think that's that frantic place. How about if we do some EFT for it? And if they couldn't do it then, they'd do it later at night. And they focused on what he was feeling in that moment rather than trying to control his behavior. I interviewed the mom when I was uh, putting this um, uh, story together because I wanted to make sure I got it accurate. And um, some of how she put things was very moving to me. And so these are her words. At one point during that really intensive period when we were working with him on this, after he had remembered Sissy's Milky all night long, and you spoke again, and you and I spoke again, you said, well, see if it comes up again, and if it feels appropriate, talk about the loss of the twin. And she says, well, and she was thinking, okay, he's four. I wonder what appropriate means. <laughs> she said, well, let's just see. And then she says, and then what was staggering to me was the realization that this little guy, two months in utero, had that experience. And then she said, I remember one day sitting with him after we had done all this, and he was in a tough spot. A child had come over. They had gotten in it. He went back into that pattern. He was really, really upset. I invited him to come into the other room with me, and we were in the middle of that place. Things were not working with his friend. He was just devastated that it was lost forever. And she said to him, you know, I wonder if this is about when you turned around and looked for who was there, and that person wasn't there anymore. Yeah, that person left. And you planned to come with someone, and it didn't work out? And she said, I remember he just started sobbing, just absolute sobbing, saying, I know what happened, but was it my fault? Now, what she didn't know, what I know from the pre and period literature, is twin loss is one of the most powerful experiences for people, very powerful imprinter of life patterns. And what do we hear adults say that are working on that material? And what do we hear that older children say? One of the biggest patterns that can come up with twin loss is a sense of, it was my fault. And so they can carry that through their life of, it's my fault. Not really knowing what that means. But if something goes bad, it's my fault. And it's my fault forever because it's permanent. So here he is as a four-year-old saying that spontaneously to his mother in this very deep emotional place. But was it my fault? That's the question he was like saying. And she said, she said uh, for me, she said this was huge. Number one, it's huge that he didn't just stare at me wondering what I was talking about. Rather, every aspect of his four-year-old self resonated with that knowing that it was truth, that it was his truth, that it was his understanding, that he had done something wrong. And that pattern has been there every time 
that he would screw up with a friend. It was his fault. He was going to lose them forever. She said, so while we were in that very emotional place together, both crying, we just did a very simple EFT. How does that make you feel? Sad. How big? Big. So, and the mom would say it. So even though the plans were to come with someone and it didn't work out, it really makes me feel sad. I deeply love and accept myself. And I'm a really good boy. And he'd say, and I'm a really good boy. <laughs> and my mom and dad really love me. And my mom and dad really love me. And it wasn't your fault. And it wasn't my fault. And she said after that, the whole pattern started dissipating. She said, I know sitting there with him that what trumped even that loss that he was feeling at two months in utero, it was, it was his fault, that belief. I thought his feelings had been about grief and loss and looking at the heart of it, it was my fault. She says, oh my gosh, I got it. So this really worked beautifully. And what I love about this work, this is the kind of work we do, I do, and we do this now in my practice. I do this with babies in utero, and I actually do it with babies preconception, that the parents and I talk with that entity, that child, that consciousness, and we do family healing work including them. So four-year-old's pretty old to be doing this kind of work. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start in uh, with uh, more, some conclusion, concluding comments. And if we have time at the end, I might tell another story. I just don't want to run over. I bring this back to the integrated self. I believe that when we support, restore, and intentionally build our multidimensional self relationship, we move towards greater dimensions of self wholeness, coherence, right relationship. We evolve. This is a book by Mark Gaffney. Um, Integrated uh, Integral Psychology, Ken Wilber. He's taken Ken's work and gone a whole nother level with it. And in his book, The Unique Self, he has this quote, evolution is the creative impulse inherent in the cosmos to unfold towards even higher levels of complexity, consciousness, and goodness. The unique self is the enlightened realization that you are both absolutely one with the whole and absolutely unique. I am and I am one with all. Two books published recently from the death and dying community literature, Dying to Be Me by Anita Morjani and Proof of Heaven by Dr. Ebert Alexander. They both beautifully portray the author's powerful um, transcendental experiences in the non-local spiritual realms during each of their near-death experiences and their realizations of themselves being absolutely one with the whole and absolutely unique. They both describe coming back radically transformed by their experiences and remained more connected to those transcendental higher octaves of awareness, knowing, and being. They experience profound healing with the direct experience of knowing that they are unconditionally loved by all that is. They are love and experience those higher octaves of oneness, joy, harmony, goodness, truth, beauty, and well-being. They returned more aligned with their transcendental self and source, seeing themselves in the world through a multidimensional lens. In Proof of Heaven, Dr. Alexander describes his transformation as a metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly. 
His direct transcendental experience changed the very nature of his being, as well as his core perspective of himself and the world. Both of them received their gifts of transformation and metamorphosis through their near-death encounters by experiencing the more real spiritual realm through their eyes of their transcendental self and returning to their embodied human self with that perspective more fully integrated into their human experience. I believe that pre and perinatal psychology, and not just pre and perinatal psychology, all of those who, many spiritual traditions um, who have talked about consciousness coming in from the, you know, from non physical into physical, all of us that take this consciousness view offer a missing piece about who we are at the beginning of life, our innate multi dimensional nature. You know, so much of what we strive for over our lifetime, you know, think of all the meditative practices, all the spiritual practices, all the healing that work that we do, all the, what we're trying to get more of those transcendental capacities within ourselves integrated, our intuitive knowingness, our primary knowing, for instance, those capacities that many of us strive to get, what we're finding in pre and perinatal psychology are are with us as we come into human life. They are part of our innate core nature of being. And they are just waiting to be discovered and waiting to be awakened and met. I believe the PPN findings show us that all these things are at the beginning of life, already there. And as we help babies, as we receive them and be conscious with them and learn what that even means. I've been, I've been you know, in this in depth for 24 years and every Every session almost, I learn something new about what it means to be present, listening, hearing, dialoguing, healing with non-conscious, preconception, all the way through. But I believe what this has the capacity is to show us the way of how, when we do this, when we help them awaken, and we discover and we enter that multidimensional world of theirs and they are met there. You know, in, in um, neuroscience, we have this brain developmental neuroscience. There's this term, lose it, use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. And that's what I see with babies in the transcendental self and their greater capacities for knowing, for communication, perception and awareness. We have these. But when we don't meet them there, it's as if something comes over and they're just not awakened. They're not met. Maya Angelo, five days before she died, tweeted this, and I, I really like this. Listen to yourself. In that quietude, you might hear the voice of God. Our transcendental self knows this. It's our innate birthright to know this. But it isn't enough to know it. It's living your life in this. Anita Morjani has this at her website, and I just love it. She said, she, she was writing a post, and she said, right now, I feel I'm home. I have no desire to be anywhere else makes no difference now whether I'm here or on the other side. It's all just different parts of the experience of our greater expanded self. I have found my true home within me, and it will follow me wherever I go. Whoops. That's the punchline, not yet. 
I believe that we are in the midst of a grand evolution, a paradigm shift of the evolution of human consciousness. And I've gotten to experience my own evolution in my being, my consciousness, and in my work with babies, children, and families that I've had the privilege of working with. From Newtonian trained, educated nurse and psychotherapist, something more was awakened that day watching William being with that baby. That window to the baby's multidimensional self and world opened and I was captivated. For 24 years, I've helped and watched as parents and professionals enter the multidimensional world of their incarnating babies, loving them, welcoming them, bringing them into their daily lives, preconception forward as a conscious and aware member of the family, learning how to hear, feel, sense, and understand their baby's needs, wishes, and communication. They learn how to include their babies and help their babies in the womb and in their arms when challenges, stress, trauma, and losses happen for the whole family. They've all learned how to go through life together and they learn healing with beautiful tools like the energy psychology ones. They've learned how to help their babies stay whole, connected with who they are and awakening their human experience within that greater embrace of self and source. It's been incredibly inspiring and beautiful to me. In 2008, under an academic grant that I led, we brought together leading clinicians in pre and perinatal psychology. They were kind of the seasoned practitioners who had worked with children and babies for many years, trained other people, because our specialty grew out of the recognition that many human conditions and life diminishing patterns were beginning during that pre and perinatal period. And our field has really mapped out a lot of that. Um, but what it meant was our understandings and what is written out there from pre and perinatal psychology is often focused on clinical problems and how to heal them. Well, my first step with welcoming consciousness in the integrated model was saying, wait a minute, it's not just all about early trauma. We're talking about this is our innate early development, our normal, our healthy, our optimal early development that we're talking. We need to put what we've learned from all that trauma and all of how we've missed it in the modern era and put it into positive ways that can help guide people. And doing the um, integrated model was one way I did it. In this way, we collaborated, came together, and we said, like the attachment community, they have core principles that they hold as guiding uh, principles that orient professionals and parents to optimal care and attachment. We came up with 12 guiding principles, uh, how to optimize human potential and relationships from the beginning of life from what we had learned with babies from a multidimensional lens. I don't have time to share those. Um, they are in an appendix in my book. Um, but I'd like to share our concluding uh, kind of inspirational paragraph that we have in our brochure for the 12 principles. Imagine a world. Imagine a world where every baby is welcomed, loved, nurtured, and seen for the amazing, conscious, and aware being they are from the beginning of life. As these babies grow, so does their capacity to love, to empathize with others, to be in relationship, to live in joy. And as our first generation matures, we'll see rippling effects grow to encompass greater learning capacity, emotional intelligence, and creativity, and the emergence of new leaders, healthier families, and communities. Our potential is unlimited. I come back to Anita Morjani's statement. I have found my true home within me, and it will follow me wherever I go. My vision, my wish for babies coming in, 
is that all babies feel I'm here embodied. I'm here and here is really good. So that concludes my main talk. And for those that are live in the studio, we're going to have our very special baby slideshow. For those that have been um, uh, listening, streaming live, or the recording, this unfortunately because of copyright can't be shared at that level. But we get it today, and I'm so tickled to now move into the fun part. Mm -hmm.